Brooke. Brooke. You can put that away now. Two more stops and we need to go. Are you still potting about that video game? It wasn't just any video game. All I had to do was collect one more amulet. I would have reached Nirvana. You would have reached Nirvana with the video game? Do you even know what Nirvana is? Of course I do. It's the final level of Teen China Spirit Fighter. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that answer wasn't supposed to make me feel sorry. I pulled you away from that life sucking device. I don't think I didn't see that eye roll. How many times <laughs> I gotta tell you I'm not one of your friends on the road? Yeah, mama. We only got one more stop, mom. I don't see why we gotta take the bus anyway. Because my car is in the shop and you guys are out of town with the other one. What could we just call an Uber or a taxi? Because you weren't paying for it. What do you have against the riding bus anyways? Only poor people ride the bus. You take the bus when you don't got any other way to get around. Well, there are thousands of people around the world who take public transportation with no problem. This is our stop, Brooke. Where are we anyway? We're on a res rescue mission. What is that supposed to mean? You see when you get there. It's super dark out here. There are a lot of street lights. Uh, are you sure it's safe for us to be out here right now? We won't be alone for long. Where in Detroit are we? We're past the city borders, but if you see the street lights, we're not far from here. Mom, this is really creepy. Well, we won't be alone for long, as long as the city rescue mission will, like, read the message. Okay, I think I hear them now. Hey, Nina, glad you can make it. Ah, yeah, I would have been here earlier if this one was dragging feet. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with my feet. <laughs> well, <laughs> so literal. So I see you have a lot of help. Yeah, dozens of people came out. We haven't worked in any groups of five to six of them. So, um, we're ready to pitch in. Um, Nina, we can use you to help pull books off the dumpster. You mean those two huge dumpsters over there full of books? Yeah. I don't get it. Why were they trash? Well, you see, these books are part of the community college library. There was some talk about reopening it, but as you can see, that never happened. I still don't see why the books were thrown away. Well, despite the city's closure, the school's closure, Thieves came in and stole like light fixtures and tackle wire and a lot of things. But most, the most part, the school stayed intact. And then a German-based real estate firm finally decided that they were going to purchase the property and then they were going to raise the site for a different type of development. Matter of fact, we wouldn't even have known the books were in the building if we had not been for a local homeowner who saw the books being thrown away. Yeah, she uploaded five photos of big dumpsters full of books on Facebook, and it's just. Unfortunately, three of the dumpsters were thrown away before we can get the call out to rescue the books. So, um, what do you have for my daughter? Brooke, right? Um, you can help my daughter, Asha, and her friends pack the books. Asha, come here. Yes, sir? Asha, this is Brooke. Brooke, Asha. Can you get us started? Sure. As, hey, y'all, this is Kim. That's Tommy. Hey. This is Brooke. As you can see, we're sorting the books into three piles. One pile, books definitely to be saved, another pile, questionable books, and the last pile is to be trashed. Wait, trash? I thought we were trying to save the books. Yeah, some of the books lost their value. Things like encyclopedias and textbooks won't do anyone too much good anymore. However, we're definitely keeping the classics and fiction books and, you know, autobiographies. <coughs> you ready to get started? Sure, but where are the work gloves? Work gloves? Do you see anybody with work gloves around here? <laughs> that doesn't mean they're not available. Stop visioning, Bridget. Come on, get to work. Actually, it's Brooke, not Bridget. Thank you, my friends. Uh, pay them more attention, Brooke. You can work with me and help sort the books in this card, okay? Alright. What is this? Yeah, you'll find a lot like that. Just say what you can. Okay. <laughs> um, come on, get to work. Didn't you hear Ash say we don't have a lot of time? It's gonna rain later, and we're trying to save as many books as possible. You're acting like you don't even care. Where are you from, anyway? Broomfield Hills or Grove Point? 
Actually, it's the same year of business. I'm from Detroit. Really? But I'm sure you don't go to school in Detroit. So are you still at Detroit Country Day or the Detroit High? Mm. How do you know you don't? How do you know I don't go to school in the city? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. She looks more like a Mercy High girl to me. Don't let me get too rough. I went to school in Rochester Hills, and I don't care if anyone knows about it. Even my cousin Kim, the cash tech snob. A snob? <laughs> I can imagine why I would have to be so proud. Maybe because such notables graduated there, like Ed Gordon, George Cushingberry, John DeLoren. Oh, Jack. Why did you get her started? I'm sorry. Listen, Brooke, we're actually glad you came to help us. We're just giving you the business. Speak for yourself, Asha. Well, I'm glad to help some ghetto kids who can really use these books. <laughs> ghetto kids? Who talks like that? Do they not use books where you go to school? Or wait, maybe you're homeschooled and all you get is your <coughs> worksheets your mom prints off. Okay, wow, that's an unfair stereotype. But no, I'm not homeschooled. I go to crime book. That explains it. <laughs> <laughs> Insulting me doesn't change the fact we're probably wasting our time if you think about it. What do you mean? Most of these books are probably digitalized anyways. For most people, it's probably better to just download these books at home on a computer or tablet. You don't really live in Detroit, do you? Yeah, and not everything is digitalized, Brooke. My father told me that there are resources here that you can't find anywhere else. And plus, not everyone in the city has access to a computer or a tablet. And even if they do, not everyone has access to the internet. And it's not just the city. There are, this is a problem for lots of areas around the whole state, regardless of it being a city or a rural area. Okay, then they can go to the library. Hmm, like this one that's shut down? There are other libraries. Or like the one that's down the street from my house that got closed down to save money. Okay, it's a problem for a lot of people. I still don't see why saving these books are so important. Unless you plan to sell them to raise money for computers. Well, Brooke, the issue is even deeper than just access. I know this may be a shock to you young people who think thousands of years of history and culture are at our fingertips, but everything is not digitalized. Yeah, like, it's like we have to save them because it's such a like tragedy that they threw the books away. City's Burning by Dudley Randall. Never heard of him. <laughs> Looks like a book of poetry. I don't know what it was about the slender volume as a catch my eye, but as I held it in my hands, it felt special. So I set it aside. After we finished packing as many books as we could for the night, I asked my mom if we could borrow the book for a while. Sure you can. It's a library book, isn't it? Now I can't tell you the last time I read a book before going to bed. But when I got home that night, I couldn't stop reading the poems. For some reason I could not explain. This book, it speaks to me. There was a poem about being a black girl. Black girl. Black girl. Lips as curved as cherries. Full as grape bunches and sweet as blackberries. Black girl, black girl, when you walk, you are as magic as a rising bird or a falling star. Black girl, black girl, what's your spell to make the heart in my breast jump, stop, shake? I know the spoke of summer days on Bella. When the leaves were the color of the sun and the island floated toward winter, you exclaimed at the fighter surging past. You looked for words to express the masterful glide. You laughed at the insolent motorboats, hurling their foaming wake upon the shore, hurling their foaming wake upon the shore. And in the flower house, delighted in the blue-celled vessel, you were ecstatic at the firmament of the bell-like flowers, reached on tiptoe to still a blossom, reached on tiptoe to still a blossom. You mixed your laughter with this melody. You listened to the tinkle of the carousel. I, watching, thought, this is how poets are. This is the inner principle of their art. Joy and delight, joy and delight. Poems conceived in joy, endowing the world with time. Joy and delight, joy and delight forever. Another spoke of black heritage that most people seem reluctant to embrace. Why are ancestors always kings or princes and never common people? Was the old country a democracy 
where every man was a king, or did the slave catcher steal only the aristocrats and leave the field hands, laborers, street cleaners, garbage collectors, dishwashers, cooks, and maids behind? My own ancestor, research revealed, was a swine herd who tinned the pigs in a royal pigsty and slept in the mud among the hogs. Yet I am as proud of him as of any king or prince dreamed up in fantasies of bygone glory. One lampoon the concept of the melting pot. There is a magic melting pot where any girl or man could step in Czech, Greek, or Scott, and step on American. Johan and Jan and Jean and Juan, Giovanni and Ivan. Step in and then step out again, all freshly christened John. Sam, watching, said, well, I was here even before they came and stepped in too, but he was tossed out before he even passed the brim. And every single time Sam tried that pot, they threw him out again. Keep out! This is our private pot. We don't want your black stain. At last, thrown out a thousand times, Sam said, I don't give a damn. Shove your old pot. You can like it or not, but I'll just be what I am. And still, another spoke of the road to the black power movement. The revolution did not begin in 1966 when Stokely raised his fist and shouted, Black Power. Nor did it begin last year when you read Fannin and discovered you were black. The revolution was going on when the first black leaped overboard to the sharks, when blacks malingered or sabotaged a plantation, or time to outwit old massa. When your father, who you deplore, pushed a broom, and your mother, who you despise, scrubbed kitchens so that you could go to school and read Fannin did not begin in 1966 when Stokely raised his fist and shouted, Black Power! Nor did it begin last year when you read Fannin and discovered you were black. <laughs> the next day, I was so excited about Mr. Randall's poems, I decided to share one of them with my teacher. Read a poem? In this class? Yes, Miss Campos, a poem by Dudley Randall. Who? Dudley Randall, you gotta know who he is. Um, refresh my memory. Here, look at this. In 1914, Hughes was born in Washington, D.C., but his family moved to Detroit when he was very young. After working at a Ford plant, the post office, and serving in the military, he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Wayne State University and a Master's of Library Science from the University of Michigan. He then became a librarian. A librarian? A librarian who writes poetry? Well, there's nothing extraordinary about that. I have a sister who has a blog who features her poetry. She's written one every day for the last three years. Ms. Campos, I'm not talking about quantity. I'm talking about quality and influence. <coughs> Mr. Randall's writings received international recognition. And in 1981, he was named Poet Laureate of Detroit. Poet Laureate of Detroit? Yep. If that's not enough, you might know him as the um, founder of the Broadside Press. This 1965. Yes, 1965, this Detroit-based press became world-renowned for publishing works by such writers as Gwendolyn Brooks, Margaret Walker, Haki Mahabuni, Sonia Sanchez, Nikki Giovanni, and Nessa Knight. From what I read, based on this achievement, Dudley Randall is considered one of the most famous cultural figures of the civil rights movement. Oh, Brooke, this is highly impressive, but this is a history class. Why don't you bring the, why don't you bring the poem to your English teacher? Ms. Campos, for the last week, we've been studying the 20th century civil rights movement, right? Correct. And this poem is relevant to what we've been learning because it talks about one of the most atrocious crimes of that area. Which is? The church bombing. Remember the Baptist church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama that left four girls dead who were attending Sunday school? Yeah, yeah, I know. But we covered that incident yesterday. Ms. Campos, you're the one who's always talking about how we should review what we learned. Couldn't this poem be used as a springboard for that discussion? Fine, when the bell rings, we'll open with your poem. This is The Ballad of Birmingham by Dudley Randall. Mm. 
Mother dear, may I go downtown instead of out to play and march to, in a freedom march in the streets of Birmingham today? No, baby, no, you may not go. For the dogs are fierce and wild. Guns and hoses, clubs and jails aren't good for a little child. But mother, I won't be alone. Other children will go and go downtown and make our country free. No, baby, no, you may not go. For I fear those guns will fire. But you may go to church instead and sing in the children's choir. She brushed and combed her night dark hair in brave babe's rose petal sweet. She drew white gloves on her night dark hands and white shoes on her small feet. The mother smiled <coughs> to know that her child was in a sacred space. But that smile was the last smile to come upon her face. For when she heard the explosion, her eyes grew wet and wild. She raced the streets of Birmingham, calling for her child. She clawed through bits of glass and brick, and then pulled out a shoe. Oh, here's the shoe my baby wore. But baby, where are you? Class, what is the subject of this poem? The Birmingham Bummy. Let's go beyond the poem's title, Kendra. That's strong. It was about the love a mother has for her child. Yeah, people can relate to that. My mother's always trying to protect me. I think she wants to keep me safe. Well, that motherly concern is certainly universal. It was way more than that. What was more? She needed to protect her child and it wasn't enough. What was needed? She needed to keep her daughter at home. That's why some people choose to homeschool their kids. No, that's not the answer. You know, just because you're at home, that doesn't mean you're safe. I mean, think about this. Remember when civil rights leader Medgar Evers was killed at home? Yes. It wasn't until the citizens, the laws, and the government took a stand to end racial violence. Right, you're right, Nevin. Somebody actually pays attention in this class. Okay, guys, <laughs> let's address how ordinary citizens and the three branches of government fought to address this issue. So Dudley Randall. Thank you, Mommy, you're the best. Well, where's my iPhone? It should have been a Snapchat or Insta Babble moment. <laughs> <laughs> Snapchat or Insta Babble? Mama, are you serious? <laughs> For the next few days, I spend my free time savoring the work of Dudley Randall and his new book my mom gave me. But there was something else about the book that um, set my imagination soaring. There was a short story entitled Victoria. The words Mr. Randall used to tell the story were so vivid that I could see the tale played out in my mind's eye. David was happy. He was waiting for Victoria to ask her a question. And if she gave him the answer he expected, he would be happier still. He had played out in the schoolyard all afternoon. And when he had enough of play, he came up to his den in the attic. His den was at the end of the attic near the one small window level with the floor. His desk was an old army blanket spread over the floor, and his bookcase was an old crate filled with his books and notebooks. The window overlooked the playground, which extended from his backyard onto the street and the school to the, near the other end of the block. He swung it open, emanating the freshness of the April afternoon and the voices of the children playing in the schoolyard. David's glance wandered over the field flooded with sunshine. A group of boys and a group of girls playing baseball and smaller children were climbing on the swing supports and horizontal bars. 
Near the alley, some older youth were playing dice, with one on the lookout for roaches. The bright shirts and dresses, the movements of the ball players, the crack of bats on balls, and the shouts of the players made the field a world of color and motion. David projected himself into the scene. He was striking the ball, he was running the bases, he was crouched in the corner over the dice, talking to them and caressing them like a lover. As David was immersed in this world of his, he became aware of another self that stood aloof watching him do these things. And then another self that stood there watching him, watching himself, almost like a series of mirrors. David didn't see Victoria in the playground, so he began to write in his notebook. In his 17th year, David first saw her and fell in love with her. She was out playing with the other girls, but she was the only one he saw. She out hit, out ran, and out laughed them all. She was tall and lithe and shapely. Her arms and legs were bare. Her skin was darkened by the color of bronze by the sun. And her voice, her voice was like the sound of silver. That was how he first saw Victoria. He learned her name from his friends and asked his big sister about it. Are you carrying a torch with Victoria? What have you seen her? She's box angled and wall eyed. She has big eyes and pretty legs. <laughs> Pay no attention to Rachel. She was only laughing at him because he was interested in another girl from the ones she tried to pair him with and whom he was never interested. David learned so much about Victoria without, ever, without, without even ever speaking to her. One day, as he, as he was shambling along the street with his eyes cast down to avoid stumbling on a level pavement, he saw a pair of small brown shoes, and then a pair of brown legs. He did not know who those shoes or legs would belong to, but there was something so fascinating and so exciting about them. Looking up, he saw Victoria coming toward him. There was not one whom he would rather have met and he began thinking of ways to avoid her. He looked about wildly, but he passed the alley and had not reached the cross street. He could turn into a doorway across the other side of the street, but that would be too obvious. He could pass her without speaking, but that was rude. But if he spoke to her first, would she answer him? Now she was upon him. What could he do? Uh, hey, David. David stretched his hand out as if to say something and, and stammered, hello. After she passed, he leant against the wall until he was able to walk again. After that, he would speak to her whenever they met. He made no attempt to seek her out or go to places where she might be. He was content with occasional chance meetings. They made his days rich and adventuresome. Who could tell when, when and where he would see her? He would speak to her, he would smile at him, and she would utter his name. Always the same thing happened to him. The blood rushed to his face. His knees grew weak. He became dizzy and could hardly speak. He would make his way home, getting excited, and write an account of the meeting. About this time, David became interested in Dante's love poetry in the new life. This expressed his life and his emotions for Victoria completely. Dante's, Dante's chance encounters with Beatrice and his adoration for her was the same as it was with Victoria because he also had chance encounters with her, and he also loved her. He would then go home, and then study the new life almost by heart every day until he memorized it. Then, he went out to go buy a book of Italian poetry and Italian grammar, and read Dante's love poetry in the original. My lady looks so gentle and so pure, when yielding salutation, by the way, that the tongue trembles and has not to say, and the eyes, which fain would see, may not endure. And still, as still, amid the praise she hears secure, she walks with humbleness for her array, seeming <coughs> a creature sent from heaven to stay on earth and show a miracle made sure. She is so pleasant in the eyes of men that through the sight the inmost heart doth gain a sweetness which needs proof to know it by. And from her lips there seems to move a soothing essence that is full of love, setting forever to the spirit. Things might have gone on like this indefinitely, 
He had another talk with Ned Adams at a local community center where David was learning how to box. Ned was older than David, about 20. Man, what's up, man? You are one hell of a fighter. You have a punch like a mule and are fast as hell. Why don't you train regular? If you keep up with it in two or three years, you can be a really good boxer. And you are probably too busy chasing all that tail, right? The girls? You get the girls, right? See, the trick with them is that they love playing hard to get. That's like their one main thing. And the thing is, you have to fall for it every time. Because girls never make the first move. It's always up to you. See, right now, I'm talking to this girl, and man, she is playing hard to get to the max extreme. And see, my tactic is that I ignore her. Just straight up ignore her for a week, maybe two, maybe three. And then one day, I catch up with her, and then you know what she does? She falls right into my lap, man. Good talk. <laughs> Victoria's not like that. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, Ned's words make him think of getting better acquainted with her so. So far, he had been content to admire her from a distance. This feeling had come on him so suddenly that he had not time to adjust to it. He was not sure what he would do, but he va vaguely imagined that sometime in the future, Victoria would be his girl. Now he began to think of some practical means of winning her. He made up his mind that the next time he meet her, instead of merely saying hello, he will stop and talk with her and learn to know her better. The very next day, when he walked to Mr. Siegel's drugstore, he saw her by standing, standing by the counter. He was totally unprepared for the meeting. At least when he met her on the street, he had some seconds of preparation before speaking to her. Now he was totally surprised, he could hardly stand, so he dropped upon the stool next to the soda fountain. Victoria smiled at him, thinking of things to say. He forgot to say anything. Oh, uh, so David, what will it be? I'll take a soda. Won't you have one with me? I just had one. His heart sank. But I wouldn't mind another. <laughs> All right, second. She sat down by his side. They began to talk of school and neighborhood events. David had often someday dreamed of talking to wise men and poets, but even in his imagination, those conversations were not as exciting as the one with Victoria. She was easy to talk with, and gradually, David became outwardly calm. But all the while, the air seemed shaking with music of organ or full orchestra, to which his heart, blood, and pulse danced right in sleep. He never knew what they said, but he noticed how long black and curly her hair was, and how it poured upon her shoulders. Her eyebrows were straight and thick, her lashes long and glossy, her eyes were large and soft, her nose delicately chiseled, her chin was copper colored and cheeks suffused with red that had the gentle curves of a child's. After she finished her soda, she stood up and said, Thanks for the soda. I enjoyed it. <laughs> David noticed the way her waist tapered from her shoulders. He sat with his head on his head, hand thinking about her. David, are you ever happy? <laughs> David looked up without a word and walked out. From this moment on, David deviled in that thought. But then he began to miss Victoria and began to get sad. David, why are you sitting in the window looking half dead? Holy Pete, if you like Victoria, why don't you just go out and get her instead of mooting in front of the window and read those silly books? But she's never invited me to her house. I wouldn't invite you to my house either if I were Victoria. In the first place, why don't you get rid of those sloppy pants and those baggy pants and sloppy sweatshirt and turn into a shirt and tie and then get some sort of bar fair. Is that what those overdressed dimwits that come see you are supposed to have? At least they're more polished than you, my shabby bookworm. But listen to me, I'm trying to help you. If you want Victoria to be yours, you gotta go out and get her. Faint heart never won, fair lady. Hmm. Why don't you just invite her out? What? Where can I take her? There's lots of places. Movies, picnics, dances. I know just the thing. My club is having a dance next month. I'll give you an invitation so you can invite her. Thanks. But you know I can't dance. I'll teach you. Come on, you have weeks to learn. 
stand so far away. I won't bite you. Your sister. Now relax. Let yourself go. Don't be so wooden. For heaven's sake, don't look so mad. If you're not in a gym. Rachel and practice by himself. Often he was stiff and self-conscious, but sometimes he forgot himself in the music. And Rachel would look at him and say, You're doing just fine. Victoria would enjoy dancing with you. So the thing about David is that he was actually getting better. And every time Rachel said gave him a compliment, it caused him to go into his own self and become terrible again. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the week, David was actually ready. So, on that fresh April afternoon, as the sun was beginning to set, David looked up into the clouds, the red and pink clouds. After that, he sat down and began to write one of the signs. How wonderfully Dante described Beatrice and the way he felt about her. How wonderful that this description fitted his own girl and himself so perfectly. The poem seemed not to be Dante talking about Beatrice, but himself speaking of Victoria. He would translate it, he would put it into English so he could read it. And at the dance, maybe he would show it to her. He turned to a blank page in his notebook and began to write. By when she makes noble, what she gazes on. How true was that about Victoria? Her eyes were soft and warm and contained nothing but kindness. Now the first line of a song is always the easiest. Now it's for the second. That which she makes noble, what she looks upon. How true was that line also. For whenever he saw Victoria, he felt cleaner and finer. And just as Dante had written the divine comedy for Beatrice, he would write a good poem for Victoria. The second line of a, of a poem was generally easy too. But the third line was when the rhymes and difficulty began. In by where she passes, all men turned their look on her. That was exactly what happened. Whenever Victoria walked down the street, for David was not the only one she attracted. When she passed, slimming and graceful, with her long black hair hanging over her shoulders, he had seen men turn around, draw their breath in, but the line did not fit with either of the other preceding lines. In her eyes, my lady bears love, by which she makes noble what she gazes on. Where she passes, all men turn their look on her, and she makes the heart tremble, and him she greets, so that all pale he lowers his eyes and sighs. Then all over his failings, anger and pride fleeing before her. Help me, ladies, to do her honor. All sweetness, all humble thoughts are born in the heart of him who hears her speak and he who first saw her is truly blessed. How she looks when she smiles a little cannot be spoken of or held in mind. She is so rare, a miracle made sure and gentle. The thought of her walking down the street reminded David that this was about the time she came to the playground. He glanced out the window. She was there. She wore a white dress like a nurse's which fits snugly at the waist. She was playing catch with another girl. Two boys stood nearby watching. She missed the ball. Missed the ball. She picked it up herself. <laughs> he tried to grab her around the waist, but she twisted smoothly away from him. That was one of the things David liked about her. She did not allow anyone to take her liberties with her even when the boys tried to do her favor because she was a girl. She refused to accept them, but kept herself in a position of equality. With them, she was a popular girl with the boys and the girls also. Everything David noticed about her made him like her even more. 
And since he stumbled on every curb and flight of stairs, was afraid to look in mirrors, couldn't think of anything to say, he admired her all the more because she was graceful, beautiful, <laughs> and friendly. That was one of the things David liked about her. She did not allow anyone to take her liberties with her, even when the boys tried to do her favor because she was a girl. She refused to accept them, but kept herself in a position of equality. With them, she was a popular girl with the boys and the girls also. Everything David noticed about her made him like her even more. And since he stumbled on every curb and flight of stairs, was afraid to look in mirrors, couldn't think of anything to say, he admired her all the more because she was graceful, beautiful, <laughs> and friendly. How clean and fresh she looked. In the museum was a torso of a Greek girl, which he loved. Victoria reminded him of this girl. But with a subtle difference, she had not the antique Greek lines and could not be expressed in cold white marble. She was like a statue of bronze, of warm, polished bronze. He imagined it to be sleek to his fingers. His attention was diverted to the schoolyard by a sudden movement. One figure split from the knot of gamblers and walked toward the far end of the yard. David recognized him as Ned Adams. Ned wore close-fitting white rayon polo shirt, blue jeans, and moccasins. He was stocky and barrel-chested, moved easily and lightly. Ned swaggered across the playground. Boys greeted them, and girls turned and looked into his face. Ned picked it up and handed it to her. But she the helped. fighters did not notice them. They stopped a few feet away from Victoria. She held the ball and looked around. Ned stared straight at her. She looked into his eyes. She dropped the ball. He picked it up and handed it to her. She smiled. They began to talk. It was growing darker. The color of the air deepened from rose to violet. One by one, small groups, the girls and boys went home. The cries and laughter fade away into the dusk. The street lamps came on. There was one of the alley near the schoolhouse that cast a silver light, but the entrance of the building, recessed, was deep in shadow. Ned was still talking to Victoria. He then leaned in close, grabbed her by the hand, and pulled her close to him. She didn't pull away, like she always did with the other boys. David's face burned. He could imagine vividly her quick smile, her large, slow-moving eyes, her ringing laughter, the sweet smell of soap on her body, the electric atmosphere about her, the impression of delicacy yet strength that her shape conveyed. He could also imagine her sensing Ned's confident grin, his powerful chest, his deep, vibrant voice, and his pungent sweat. <laughs> David's whole body was on fire. He would go down there. He would join them. He would make believe he was passing by and would stop with and talk with them. But something kept him rooted there, like a spectator at a play who identifies himself with the actors, but who can in no way influence it. Part of himself was Victoria, and another part was Ned, and another part was himself watching himself, the actor, with another self watching himself, the observer. Ned and Victoria were at the steps of the building. They moved together into the shadows. David was trembling. He hated Ned. He hated Victoria. He would fight Ned. He would punch him into ribbons. Victoria! Why have you done this to me? Why have you betrayed me? You are no good. You are cheap. You are easy. No, why blame Victoria? What made you think she was yours? What made you think she, was, she liked you? What do you have over Ned? What do you have to offer? The book of poetry, which he had been clutching, slipped from his hand. He picked <laughs> up the book. He flung the book down with a sob. It was black dark now, too dark to read. 
So much negativity, you know, on TV, in the news, in the movies. I'm that ruined porn you find on the internet. Ruin what? Ruin porn? You know, those doctors who take pictures of deteriorating buildings in Detroit. I learned about it in my civics class. Well, what about it? It seems like there's so much negativity, and you forget there's a lot to be proud of in this city. I live in Detroit, and I aspire to do great things just like Dudley Randall. Maybe one day I'll help be part of the movement to change the image of Detroit for the better. Well, you necessarily don't have to be a young, old to make a change. You know, Mr. Rhonda wrote a poem, it's probably in a book, about the rebirth of Detroit. Do you know it? I think that's my cue. <laughs> Cities have died, have burned, yet Phoenix life returned, to soar up livelier and lovelier than before. Detroit has felt the fire, yet each time left the fire, as if the fire had the power to restore. First, burn away the myths of what it was and is, a lovely tree-lined town of peace and trade. Hatred has festered here, and bigotry and fear filled the streets with strife and raised the barricade. Wealth of a city lies not in its factories, its marts and towers crowding to the sky, but in its people who possess grace to imbue their lives with beauty, wisdom, charity. You have those too long hid, who built pyramids, who searched the skies and mapped the planet's range, who sang the songs of grief, that made the whole world weep, who's Douglas, Malcolm, and Martin rung and change. The Indian with his soul, attuned to natural role, the sons and daughters of Cervantes smile, pen to do's children too, entrust their fate to you, Souls forged by Homer's, Dante's, Shakespeare's, Goethe, Yeats styles. Together we will build a city that will yield to all hopes and dreams so long deferred. New faces will appear, too long neglected here. New minds, new means, with the, new minds, new means will build a brave new world. <laughs> 